The focus of this video is what is a monopoly, and it's continuing our discussion on market structure. So if we think of a market structure as a continuum, where on one side we have perfect competition, PC, and on the other side we have monopoly. In between we have our monopolistic competition and oligopolistic. The easiest way to tell the difference between these different market structures is how many firms there are in the market. When we get to the perfect competition side, it's a very high number of firms. But as we move along this continuum, we have less and less firms in the market until we get to a monopoly where there's only one. There's one firm selling everything. So with monopolistic competition, we still have a very high number, but less than perfect competition. Oligopolistic, even less, but more than monopoly. And other ways to think about a firm's influence on price. For a monopoly, it's very high. In fact, they can choose how much they're going to charge for their product. The only thing they have to keep in mind is that the higher price they choose, the less of the product they'll sell. And their influence on price gets lower and lower as there are more firms in the market until you get to perfect competition where they have no influence on the price. They're price takers. They have no influence. So in order for a monopoly to hold, there are three conditions. The first condition is that only one firm sells a product or good. That's pretty easy. We know this from our discussion above. Only one firm sells a product or good. The second condition is that there are no close substitutes to the good. Because if there were close substitutes, then people could buy those and ignore the monopoly. An example might be a pen firm, a firm that makes pens. They could have a monopoly, they could be the only company that sells pens, but pencils could be a close substitute. So if the price got too high, people would just stop using pens and start using pencils. Another example might be the energy market or electricity. You would think that electricity has no close substitutes, but if the price of electricity got really, really high, people may start buying generators or lighting candles or finding a substitute. So the key word to remember here is close. If the price of bottled water got to be really high, you might start drinking water out of the tap. So just because you can't think of any good substitutes doesn't mean there aren't close substitutes. So they really have to monopolize not only that one good, but a section of that good. They have to have control over all the close substitutes in order for it to be meaningful. The third is that there are barriers to entry. which protect the monopoly from competition. So this means that a monopoly has to have a lot of capital. In other words, think of a car manufacturer. If there was only one company producing cars, say Toyota, and somebody else wanted to start up a car manufacturing company, they would require a lot of money to invest in all of the goods, factories, capital, and everything else necessary to start that company. Another form of barrier to entry is government protection. So these are common with utility companies. You can think of electrical companies, water, and even cable TV. They get protected by the government to be the only supplier of that good in the area. And they do it because it makes sense. Think of having multiple power lines running to your house instead of just one. So these are government regulated monopolies. Another easy way to 
keep track of what Monopoly means is to just think about the classic board game. When you play Monopoly, the board game, what is your goal? Your goal is to buy up all of the properties of a certain color, so then if somebody lands on them, you can charge a higher price. And this is essentially how monopolies work in the real world. They buy up all of the producers or suppliers of a product so that they're the only ones and they can then charge a higher price.